Dr. Cohen, I'm very interested to hear about some of your research looking at the psychosocial determinants of health. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Okay, so the um, so around here, it would not surprise you that most most of my colleagues, uh, whether researchers or at the bedside, probably imagine that that the life course can probably be reduced to three major elements. First, you're born and bring with you a full complement of uh, genomic determinants. Um, and then you get old enough to begin a course of bad behavior. And many of my colleagues are very attuned to the role that behavioral aspects play, bad habits, choices about activity, those kinds of things. Right. And then finally, at some point later on, you begin to interact with the healthcare system. Um, something goes awry a little bit, and then the rest of your life course to the end is heavily dominated by the degree to which you successfully or less successfully uh, manage your, your sort of interactions with that healthcare system. So it, it, I think, became clear, you know, some years ago, very notably, um, after the war, a group of investigators in London began looking at accumulating data on health and mortality, which was finally becoming available, both from developed countries and around the world, but especially from developed countries, and began to recognize that there were huge clusters of patterns that actually probably defied what we knew at that time about Mendelian inheritance and was certainly not entirely about behavior, namely that if you knew nothing more about a person from the day they were born than their race, ethnicity, um, their parental education, um, and what neighborhood they were going to grow up in, you could with remarkable precision predict what their life course was going to look like, certainly something that actuaries had figured out. And that it turned out that social environment, and with it the physical environment that we live in, uh, likely are huge determinants. In fact, so important that they probably now that we understand it better 50 or 60 years later, are the things that trigger many of the adverse genes that my colleagues have studied and are beginning to think about so much, but certainly are also very deeply integrated in the behavioral patterns that people develop, so that many of those behavioral patterns are a consequence of social environment growing up and continue in an interactive way through our, all of our social interactions to be a, a consequence of the environment that we live in. So much so that, you know, just in my own personal case here at age 58, I moved to, to Stanford after having spent my entire life on the East Coast and through, frankly, not even thinking about it, have evolved an incredibly different diet. I go to the gym three times a week. Um, I climb up every stair that sits in front of me, not jumping on an elevator. And literally none of these things were either, I mean, I knew enough at 58 as a, as a general internist to, to understand what, um, what the implications were of all the bad habits that I had, dietarily, physically, and otherwise. And yet, living in a culture like the one that's prevalent on the peninsula, like the one that's prevalent around this campus, quite substantially the kind of people I interact with change the way I live. And it really is a matter of, you know, where, I mean, from my point of view, where social environment begins to, begins to weigh in the overall equation to itself. So that's been the focus of, of study. Many of my colleagues have focused their energy very early in the life course. Um, I think if I had it to do over again, I might have made that same choice because I'm increasingly believing that a lot of the biologic plasticity, a lot of the behaviors, a lot of the gene-environment interactions are happening very early. But in fact, I've devoted most of my life to studying work and adult environments because I think we spend a ton of time there and it's where a lot of our, our social environment evolves. Right. Well, I find this very interesting because here we are at this conference where there's a lot of people studying genetics, so that's the nature part of it. And you're studying the environmental part, which is the nurture aspect. Correct. And mm -hmm. you're saying that the two are very much closely related and can even affect each other. Uh, well, there's very little doubt that they do. I think that, you know, put in the context of what we're, of the, of the explosion in biology that's happening, we're beginning to learn that, that Darwin didn't entirely have it right. It's a, 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 an enormous amount of, of our true biologic footprint that, that does turn out to be quite mutable, maybe even transmissible vertically, so that mothers to, to, to infants both, both carried around the genome, the so-called epigenome, which now consists of, of these chemical reactions, these methylations that occur, both on genetic material itself as well as the protein, the histone proteins that, that protect it. 
Um, and so a lot of the interesting energy now, the sort of the, how all this gets under your skin, we're now beginning to look at that sort of bio, set of biologic processes as the way what's out here begins to become biologically expressed and begins, I think, to explain some of how it is, not just our bad behaviors, but, but other things that are going on in our environment that are literally changing us, unbeknownst, of course, to, to us. So sooner or later, we'll have a picture that, you know, that takes all of these various fragments and puts them together. But I think that the, the work that many of, of, of the old line geneticists before the era of, of, of being able to sequence DNA um, studied in which we recognize that perhaps 10 or 20 or maybe as much as 25% of our, of our biologic fate comes from inheritance. Um, that's probably about right. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Cullen. Fascinating.